Hi, and welcome to Basic Folk, where we have honest conversations with folk musicians on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network. I'm your host, Cindy Howes. Hi, thanks for finding us. Before we get into today's guest, Alice Gerard, a couple of things. First of all, have you signed up for the Basic Folk newsletter? Well, if you haven't, you should. You can find a link to sign up in our show notes. Or you can check out basicfolk.com and click on the red sign up for the newsletter button. Really is the best way to keep in touch with your favorite little folk podcast. You can also follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Basic Folk Pod. And occasionally I've been posting on TikTok. You can also follow us there at Basic Folk Pod. We'll see how that goes. Another thing is that we are listener supported. That's right. You can make a contribution and help keep the train on the tracks here. You can get a Basic Folk beanie by going to the store and giving $5 a month and you'll get a hand knit beanie with a little Basic Folk tag on it. We are well into beanie season. You can get yours again at the store, basicfolk.com. Okay. Bluegrass hero and former weird kid Alice Gerard strongly believes that traditional music is connected to everyday life. She has said, when you listen to traditional music, you have such a sense of this connectedness to a person's life. It comes out of the earth. She was first exposed to folk music while attending Antioch College in Ohio. Jeremy Foster, her boyfriend at the time, who would then become her first husband, introduced her to the Harry Smith Anthology of American Folk Music. Upon listening, she became hooked and more drawn to the lonesome and rough folk songs versus the pristine vocalists. That mentality of keeping her performance untarnished and imperfect has followed her ever since. After she and Jeremy moved to Washington, D.C., she became acquainted with Hazel Dickens. She considered Hazel a mentor figure and studied her musicality. The two would record four albums together as the seminal duo Hazel Dickens and Alice Gerard. The two did not speak for many years after they split in the late 70s. The breakup was messy and hard for both, particularly Hazel. Years later, they reconciled and would perform and were close until Hazel's death in 2011. Nowadays, Alice, who lives in Durham, North Carolina, has been digitizing her huge photo archive for a book, as well as performing with the younger generations of traditional music. People like Tatiana Hargraves, Reed Stutz, and Phil Cook are regulars on her stage. They also contribute to her new album, Sun to Sun. Alice digs in talking about her unorthodox parenting style, which is no secret, imperfectionism, appreciating memory, and the fantastic new record. We're going to take a listen to the title track from the new album, Sun to Sun, and then we'll get to our conversation with the legendary Alice Gerard on Basic Folk. Alice Gerard, it's so nice to meet you. Thanks for being on Basic Folk. You bet. And it's a pleasure to meet you, too. I love your hair. Oh. <laughs> Looking good. I think I went a little <laughs> overboard this time. I just smear stuff in it every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, the episode you did with uh, on Toy Heart with Tom Power. Oh, um, yeah. I listened to that. And then also that beautiful documentary, You Gave Me a Song, that I actually watched it today and then was like wrecked for like a couple oh, hours. No. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> in a good way, like wrecked in a good way. Um, but as a former weird kid, I wanted to start by hearing about your relationship to weirdness. Um, so as a kid, you were drawn to quirky pop songs. Like you talked on Tom's podcast about the Rosemary Clooney, come on <laughs> in my house with that bizarre harpsichord or like the weird nature boy song from Nat King Cole. 
Um, you have also spoken of your affinity for like the lonesome and rough voices in bluegrass and old time, like particularly like being drawn to to those types of voices on the Harry Smith an- anthology versus like the pretty or pristine singers. So here comes a question. Okay, um, what well, that's is all right? By the what way, what is yeah <laughs> great. What is it about musical oddities that catch your attention? Um, does this draw to the strange translate in other aspects of your life? Um, I've often asked myself that same question, you know, what is it about this music that I did not grow up with that I'm so so drawn to, although I was drawn to the odder pop sounds like like the Rosemary Clooney harps come on in my house and all the rest of those I mean they just there was something about the mysterious quality of nature boy and wild goose and stuff like that and the sound of the harpsichord it was just so amazing um that I was drawn to my parents were musicians they were more classical musicians but they played a lot around the house so I heard them a lot, and I think that sort of gave me my sort of first sense of, you know, you could make music. You, you didn't have to go to a concert. You could just sit around home and play music. So that when mm-hmm. when I entered into the sort of more folk, uh, informal world of traditional music, it, I felt pretty much at home. But... It's it's always interesting to me that a lot of young people at that time in the fifties um, were also who were not did not grow up with the music were also being drawn to, and I think the Harry Smith anthology had a lot to do with that because so many people listened to that, and there was so much great stuff on it, and the fact that I was drawn to the the sort of more lonesome sounds, uh, you know, sad songs. I don't know what that is, you know, but I've heard people say, this friend of mine who's uh, a Cajun musician, you know, he would say, you know, the, the the sadder the song, the happier I feel. And I think there's some truth in that. But I also think that, you know, I mean, I'm I'm no psychiatrist, but my dad died when I was a little girl. And I think that when you lose somebody in your life at, at a young age, there's something in you that just sort of is sad forever, kind of. Mm. And mm-hmm. maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. But mm. I'd have to go talk to a shrink. Find out. <laughs> but I, I mean, I just love that those sounds. You know, the edgier singing sounds, the not sweet, pretty pop sounds, but the edgier sounds of people like Hazel Dickens and Wilma Lee Cooper and Molly O'Day and people like that. The answer is I don't really know, but I just kind of guessing. And I think that, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I ask myself, why did all these young city kids start getting into sort of traditional music and and bluegrass music kind of all around the same time, I think. And I think this anthology had a lot to do with it. But I've often wondered if, you know, we were sort of middle class city kids who did not have particularly settled lives, you know, were somewhat Mm -hmm. transient and, and this sort of idea of, people who lived in a community all their lives and knew everybody in their community and helped one another out to to a large extent. That was something of a, it was an ideal situation, but it was also attractive to a lot of us, I think, Mm. in some ways. Cool. Mm -hmm. Another cool observation you've made is how traditional music is connected to everyday life. Here's a couple quotes from you. Uh, When you listen to traditional music, you have a sense of this connectedness of this person's life. And you said, I love powerful traditional music because it's connected to everyday life. And even that this new album showcases traditional music as a humanizing and galvanizing force. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. So can you speak more to how traditional music creates human connection? Well, first of all, it's not a written down tradition. It's an oral 
tradition. And um, so people who grew up with this music learned it from other people in their community. And I feel like the music comes out of people's lives. It just is, it kind of grows out of the ground somehow or other, along with the people in the community who play it. And they use it for recreation, you know, they play for dances, or they used it to sit around on the porch at the evening, in the evening, and just entertain themselves. And I have a friend who, who was an old fiddle player that lived around Galax, and he would say, you know, we used to play a lot after supper and sit around. Now everybody sits around and watches TV. And, you know, that's true. I mean, <laughs> but mm-hmm. so things change. But it, you know, they talked about things in their everyday life. Uh, there was a fellow that lived around Freeze, Virginia, and he wrote songs. He, he was just a country guy who loved to write songs and he wrote about all the things he knew about his hometown of Freeze, like Henry Whitter was from Freeze. He wrote this song about Henry Whitter. He wrote a song about cornbread and something, beans, or something like this. And he put out a little cassette tape. And so it was just, but then there was a guy, of course, who moved down to Galax from West Virginia and he made a little 45 recording of entitled, They'll Never Put a Man on the Sun. <laughs> so that wasn't... <laughs> anyway, so, but I feel like it, it's one of the things about this music is that it's, you know, in the case of, you know, ballads and things like that, a lot of them, well, it's, who knows where they originally came from, but but they were passed down word of mouth from people in the community or parents or grandparents and things like that. And then, you know, there was always, there was music accompanying everything in the community. I remember people Mm. talking about, you know, at graduation from school, they'd have um, a fiddle and a banjo leading a procession in the playground. You know, the fiddle would lead one line and the banjo would lead the other. They just march around and weave in and out and stuff like this. It was called school breaking. And um, and dances, of course, dances were a big thing. And I think just music that people listen to as well. You know, neighbors would come in and play or everybody, all, a lot of, there weren't many people who didn't play in some form or fashion. Hmm. Did you ever come, uh, do you know Shirley Collins? I know who she is, yeah. You guys have never met? I, no. not that I remember be kind of cool to get you two together (laughs) yeah she's she's a great singer yeah uh one emmy lou harris in your documentary had this great quote about your particular style of music she said it's an unvarnished sound it's not concerned with perfection and that's the way to tell the story so you are a self-taught musician and it seems like you are not too precious about your playing um, or of your voice and let's just state that both are iconic, uh, but there is this like chill vibe to your effort. So uh, I'd love to hear this from you. Like, what is your relationship to your singing and playing? Oh boy, that's a good question. Let me think about that for a second. Um, Well, I was very influenced by a number of people. I was completely influenced by Hazel Dickens because she was a friend, and I was hanging out with her a lot when, when I lived around D.C., and she lived in Baltimore. And we just all hung out together, a bunch of us. And and I listened to her for a long, long time before I ever started singing. So I think, you know, I think that I always tell people that if you want to do this music, you have to listen to it. It's super important. And you begin, and you try to absorb the sounds of it. And so I think that's what I was listening to for a long time before I ever opened my mouth. Hazel and other people, other women, well, a lot of men too, Bill Monroe for sure, and the Stanley Brothers, and but Ola Bell Reed and Molly O'Day and Lily Mae Ledford and all these people, <laughs> these women uh, who sang with powerful voices. I mean, there wasn't, it was a time also, when in the folk music world, there was a lot of, the trend was to have sort of 
high, pretty voices. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but that was the trend, and we were bucking that trend to some extent. So that when you hear Wilma Lee, just, Wilma Lee Cooper just belt out a song, you know, full voice and sing with, it was it was really great. And Hazel did that too. And I just, and the, if you listen back to old recordings of people, that's kind of the way they sang. And of course, white Southern music was totally influenced by black music too so there was this blues edge to everything to a lot of things Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. a lot of very wonderful approaches to a note you know like you don't just well sometimes you do you just sing it straight on like in shape note music or something like that but in general and this is carried over from the old days into country music too. You know, you approach a note, you slide into it, you slide off of it, you maybe turn it around. And there's a lot of improvisation that goes on in the singing. And I think that you listen to people like Bill Monroe or the Stanley Brothers and you hear those high tenor voices and 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 you just it just becomes part of you in some ways. Mm. Just you just absorb it. And that's yeah. what, you know, I wanted to sound like that. I didn't want to sound like Judy Collins or Joan Baez. Not, you know, no offense, but I, I just didn't. Yeah, no shade. Know. No. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did not want, we were, that was, well, we didn't want to do that. Mm, mm. Someone uh, called your sound feminine. Do you agree with that? Or how do you think your sound is feminine? Well, I'm a woman. Maybe hmm. that's what it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Depends on what they meant by that, I guess. <laughs> yeah. But I'm who I, think I it was am. A man that said it. Oh, did they? They say feminine, feminine, but, and then followed it with some other. No. Adjective. No. It was in the do- it was in the documentary. It was a friend, not oh, a foe. Oh, yeah. Said it. I think he was I, I have referring no idea. back to I wish I had m- more notes on that. <laughs> um, but just wondering what you thought of that. Um, I don't have a problem with that. It, you know, it's just, I mean, it's hard to know exactly what they meant when they were using mm-hmm. the term. Cause Is there a way that it could have been bad? Not, No, not necessarily, unless they're using it to define a sound that is more pretty than gutsy or edgy or whatever because i mean i don't mind pretty sounds i sing i sing some (laughs) notes very prettily but then i my basic style is to sing full out you know and it you know as you get older that gets harder and harder to do you have to really work on maintaining your voice and stuff like this so Mm -hmm. but there you go So this brings us to talking about ego in bluegrass and old time, um, which I don't. I know very little about actually. Like, I know about the good old boys club that exists oh, yeah. in every world, and in particular, uh, you've spoken about that world existing in bluegrass and old time. But the songs in this genre come off as either being like ego less or like. A healthy balance of ego and I'm sure there's like more to it but what is your experience with ego and folk music and where does it exist for you um I think that I mean you are what you are and I think it's it's a matter of self-confidence a lot of it you know I think that women in particular have had a difficult time and so a lot of them a lot of us really lack self-confidence that we can go ahead and just do this thing. And that comes from many different places. It's a cultural thing. Um, often, where in, in the culture that you grew up in, women are confined more or less to the home and raising the kids, and which isn't always true, but that's sort of a general assumption that you, you could make. As far as 
you know, and I think that if you're fighting that all the time and trying to, like, I think Hazel, she grew up in that culture. And so she had, she lacked a lot of self-confidence at first. And it took just a lot of um, friends gathering around and just giving her, telling her how that it was a great sound that she had and you know she should and then when she started writing songs you know oh those are great songs hazel you know and i think i think she had to fight that to some extent um mm-hmm. for a long time at first but fortunately there were you were surrounded we were surrounded by a lot of people who were very um supportive of us mm-hmm. but they were not necessarily in the bluegrass world, you know, like some people were. And I think it was harder for her because she was, before she and I started doing stuff together, she was playing with these bluegrass bands that would be playing in the little bars in Baltimore, you know. And it was, and she's talked about this before, you know, it was, you know, she played bass and she, she was the chick singer, you know, who could do one Kitty Well song or something like that. That was kind of mm-hmm. where women were relegated. Um, and I think it it just took a lot of, <sighs> people had to fight with, I think women had to often fight with themselves internally to say, I'm just gonna go ahead and do this. I remember, I don't know if you know who um, Gloria Bell is, she's, um, but I think she just died recently. It's really sad. Hmm. But when we would go to the country music parks north of Baltimore to hear musicians play all afternoon, she would often come with her mother. This was just in near the Pennsylvania, Maryland line. And her name was Gloria Flickinger and she'd come with her mom and she played the banjo and she played the mandolin and she sang and she was good at all these things. And she would come and, you know, I think her mother was encouraging her to do this. She would go up and ask whoever was playing on the stage if she could get up and do a few songs with with them. And they usually did let her do that. And But she got a lot of flack for that. You know, it was like, who the hell does she think she is kind of stuff. They did not let her do it. Well, they did. They did, but oh, I mean, did. other oh, people, okay. other people would say, you know, we don't, you shouldn't be up there. I mean, there was a little of that, not, I mean, it wasn't huge, but mm-hmm. there was some of that. And then, of course, she, 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 but all she wanted to do was play music. And so she went ahead and just played with different people. She found people to play with on the radio. She moved to Nashville. She joined Jimmy Martin's band, which was, <laughs> He was so mean to her. I can't believe it. Anyway, and she, but she just fought it all her life. She had to fight that. And, mm-hmm. uh, but she was such, and she was such a good musician. And it's, you know, I was talking with Murphy Henry the other day and thinking somebody should have interviewed her about all this stuff. I don't know whether she would have talked about it, but, but yeah, it's, it's ego. It's something that you're not supposed to have or show it on the outside. But in order to battle with some of these preconceptions and attitudes, you have to sort of have it. You have to be willing to to kind of go for it in some mm-hmm. ways. Not so much Great. anymore, but probably, it, but back in the day, it was much more mm-hmm. like that. Back in the day, the ladies could have used more ego. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the men yeah. maybe turn it down. Yeah, a little well, bit. definitely. I mean, the, there were women, like, there was the Stoneman family in Washington, D.C. It was a family of musicians with um, Donna, who played the mandolin, and Ronnie Stoneman played mm-hmm. the banjo. And then they had brothers, and, and another sister played guitar, auto hopper, I forget which. And um, But they played all over the place. And these girls... I mean, if you ever, if you've ever seen Ronnie Stoneman, she's just a pistol. You know, she'll say anything, and <laughs> and she'll talk about talk about it. You know, it doesn't matter. And um, but they had a family supporting them. It was a family band, and she had brothers mm-hmm. who played in the band. And so 
and with Wilma Lee Cooper, who was a very powerful person, she she basically fronted their band, she, but she played with her husband, who was the fiddle player. So it was Wilma Lee and Stoney Cooper. And um, she was very strong, but she had a husband there who w- backed her up and was her partner. And that probably made it easier. But then there were people like Cousin Emmy, who was by herself. I don't I don't know that she ever got married, but she toured. She was an early touring performing artist. She'd play radio stations and travel around. And I remember she a friend of mine said she told him one time that she had to fight a radio guy to, to pay her. He had agreed to pay her a certain amount of money and then when it came time to pay her, he didn't want to pay her and she basically had to kind of like punch him in the nose or something. <laughs> oh, God. Fight him for the money. I don't know what fight mm. meant, but so so it was it was you know, and in in traditional cultures, you know, there were so many women who played. I mean, you hear some of these old guys that played banjo, and and including Ralph Stanley, he used to, talked about his mother and how what a big influence she was. He learned from her. This fellow I play with some now is a pedal steel player who learned steal from his mother and and there were just all these women who played but they just didn't play out they played at home mm-hmm. when they had mm-hmm. a chance your brother philip um in the documentary sorry i keep referring to the documentary it was that's such, okay so good <laughs> <laughs> he said this thing about you that that uh, I thought was such a killer observation. He said there was a direct ascent on Alice's part from her rebelliousness and independence as a child to her ability to make something of herself in the world that she chose, which I related to that as like a form, formerly rebellious child who is now like a very productive <laughs> adult in the world that I chose. Um, so I'd love to hear more about that from you. Like, how do you see that attribute in yourself? Like, do you see it in your children or your grandchildren? Um, yeah, I do see it in my kids to some extent. I think with me, it was sort of translated in, into being a difficult child. You know, I think my parents and, and my stepfather, you know, I mean, I think it was uh, for whatever reason, I was very rebellious. and um, And so they were always trying to get me to do things like the time I think it was mentioned in the film we we moved to Mexico for a year when I was after my father died and my mother said that if he, at the end of the year she'd make this good Alice bad Alice column on a piece of paper and if I had more good Alice things than bad Alice I could have a horse <laughs> which was the only thing I ever wanted back in that day and um and so at the end of the year, apparently I had more good than bad marks against me. And I got it. Was everyone surprised? Well, I think I probably tipped the scales a lot. And you know, I think I brought mm. to her attention, hey, I brought the groceries in from the car or whatever, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I just had that reputation. And I was kind of a tough kid, you know, who was rebellious. And I feel like... I like relate to that a lot. Yeah. Uh, and and it being like kind of like a bad thing, like you were a tough kid, you were you were like a rebellious kid. But then I really loved the way that Philip was like it translated into her being like a badass adult who did whatever she wanted and have it come true. Well, you know, it's interesting because I also said in the film and I think it was really true that somehow or other the way I grew up, I never felt like I couldn't do something if I wanted to do it. I never felt like somebody was keeping me from doing something. Mm-hmm. And um, so that... Where did that come from? My mother was a very strong person. She was also a very sick, ill... I mean, she had rheumatoid arthritis, and I oh, grew up with... awful. It was awful. And she got it when she was in her early 20s. So she had it Oof. most of her life. And she was often in great pain. And I just sort of remember 
sick, you know, her being sick as being like, her sickness was like a third person in the family that was this dark wow. spirit. And, but at the same time, she fought it like crazy. And she would do stuff like later on, she she got a bicycle and she rode it because she thought it would strengthen her, you know, you know, it would be good for her to do that. And she she was always, and she always had a very bright outlook. You know, you'd say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Which at the same time was like, oh, no, come on, tell us the truth. <laughs> but, but I think that that translated to me in some ways as a very, and she was a piano player. She was a really good piano player. And instead of, and she played the piano on up until she was, my age or she was she died before that but she played and she you know she sight read music she was really good she played by ear really well and she played all these really difficult pieces but she would adapt them to what she could do with her hands she made these little leather fingertip things that she put on the ends of her fingers so that when she hit the keys it it kept it from being too sharp on her fingers. And then she just kept playing, you know, she just never quit. Oh, wow. And and I think I saw that as a very, I mean, somehow or other that registered with me as a real strength, even though we had a difficult relationship, I still think that, you know, she was a very strong person. Good and just in, in spite of all the stuff, she just forged mm. ahead and did what she had to do. Sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, I've lately I've been like everything I'm doing. I'm like, oh, that's what my mom would do. That's what my mom <laughs> would do. And then I'm sort of like in like an embracing stage of like, oh, yeah, this all makes sense. This is the person I spent the most amount of time with in my life. So yeah, it's, it's like a bit of a relief, isn't it? Well, you know, I didn't actually. I mean, I spent. I, when I left home to go to college, I basically never went back home. And so they were on the West Coast and I was on the East Coast. And I did not, you know, I took my kids out a couple of times to visit, but we did not spend that much time in my adult life together. Mm. But we were always in touch. And um, so I think that there were difficulties that, were prob problematic for me, but I think there was something about what my mother was like that really resonated too. Because mm -hmm. I think she was a child who was difficult. I mean, she, her mother <laughs> had eight children and she, my mother was the last one and she gave her away to her sister after she was born. Mm -hmm. I know. So, but, but the, the, her father after at about a year, he couldn't stand anymore. He went and got her. But still, you know, you got to feel like, nah, that, yeah, that probably. I mean, had... that kind of stuff, I think, stays in your yeah. system. Yeah. But she was, she was a, you know, they called them tomboys back then. I guess they still use that term, don't they? But she, she considered herself a tomboy. And she had three brothers and mm -hmm. um, four sisters. Um, I had a question about, uh, parenting style uh oh um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> this one go. might be a little a little hairy um so your kids in the documentary described your parenting style as free-range parenting among other <laughs> things which sounds like i don't know helicopter parenting is also not good but it sounds like the ex like the opposite of helicopter parenting and how do you think the way that you were raised impacted your parenting and how do you reflect on it um i don't know how it informed my parenting but i feel like jeremy my husband and i when we started having kids it was like okay now we we've got a kid let's have another one to keep that one company and we just were so <laughs> clueless you know and we didn't you know like in most most people who decide to have children have thought out, have a plan, you know, for how they're going to deal with their lives with kids. We did not. We had, we were just 
flying by the seat of our pants. My parents were not around to help. His father had died quite a while ago. His mother um, wasn't around that much to help. And we just didn't have relatives, you know. So we were kind of on our own, and we would just take the kids everywhere with us, and they'd fall asleep on the floor, on a pallet, you know, when we were at a party or something like this. And there wasn't, and they they did that. I mean, they, you know, I don't think that was a big problem for them at the time. I think it was when they got older, and we just did stuff that was really stupid as far as parenting. Today, it would be called, they'd probably arrest you. <laughs> Yeah. For, 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 I don't know. It was just like we did stupid stuff. Like we lived in this small town for a while while Jeremy was in basic training or whatever because he was drafted when he dropped out of school. But anyway, so we had one child at that point who was a baby. And I remember a friend came to visit us. We wanted to go to a movie at the local movie theater, which was is a very small town. So we parked the car, left her in the car in her in her the buggy top that served as a car bed. And she was sound asleep. We went into the movie and every once in a while, one of us would go out and check and she was fine. And, you know, but that was God, if you did that now, <laughs> it's, it's terrible. Yeah, it's yeah. bad. But so nothing happened. But that's kind of how we lived our lives. And, and they just, mm. it was, and you know, then when, when I started playing music and touring more, it was a constant struggle to find babysitters, you know, and, and that was a hard, it was very hard. And I didn't think in terms of, why don't you get your life together and try to find somebody to come and live in the house with you, like some people did. But that just somehow didn't occur to me. It was like, okay, maybe the neighbor will, the next door neighbor will sit. Or, you know, I'd ask friends and they'd tell me about people who were looking to, for a place to stay for two weeks and that would work out nicely. And, and it worked out for the most part, okay. I mean, nothing horrible ever happened. Um, mm -hmm. Except one babysitter gave my kids weed. It was, <laughs> it was okay. Yeah, I know. Well, what? They loved her. I mean, they loved her. She was a fanatic. She loved the incredible string band. I don't know if you, that was her, you know, and, and they just loved her. And she was just this really wonderful person, but she smoked a lot of weed and she would give it to the kids. I found out later. Um, and I don't think it didn't damage them, <laughs> <laughs> but it was, wow. you know, that's just kind of the way things were, you know, so it was like, you know, I don't know. I think, hmm. honestly, I don't think I was ready at all to have kids when I had them. And Jeremy, hmm. maybe not so much either, but I think he was naturally more inclined than I was. Mm -hmm. But we just kept having kids. <laughs> I well, know. from the documentary, they all seem really cool. They're, and they're great kids. Strong and Strong. And they managed to survive, which is... Seems like Amazing. there's also like a lot of honesty in your communication with each other because yeah. I'm watching the documentary thinking like they really let me have it, didn't they're they? They're telling <laughs> they're telling the truth. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they are. And like Jesse said, uh, he's my youngest that that in some ways they're all kind of recovering from their childhood. And um I think that's probably true. Some have mm -hmm. done better than others. I mean, are having an easier time of it. I have a couple more questions about yeah. Hazel. Um, in our interview right now, I've noticed a couple times when I ask you questions about you, mm -hmm. you maybe answer a little bit and then you start talking about Hazel. Hmm, um, okay. And I'm wondering what it's been like for you to have gone through the experience of being a woman uh, during the 50s, 60s, 70s with alongside like living parallel with somebody like Hazel, kind of like experiencing similar things and being able to 
see your own experience in a way reflected back uh, from Hazel's experiences? I mean, I think that especially when we started this uh, Southern tours that Anne Romaine and Bernice Regan started, you know, she, I had never experienced that. We went into the mountain South, we went into the deep South and, you know, I had not really ever done that or, but she had lived that. And I feel like to some extent I was experiencing it through her eyes too. But at the same time, I was also f having my own feelings about it, and and I feel like um, it was important for me to to feel that way too, and not mm -hmm. just have it be a reflection of Hazel. Because I mean, she grew up in a traditional culture, and as much as she had changed and adapted, and people and grown as a person, there were still some things in her culture that dictated how she saw things and that I, mm. it was hard for me to reconcile those but but yeah it was very important for for a long time but then I, I feel like part of the reason I was feeling uncomfortable later on was that I just I needed to figure out my own my own identity yeah yeah yeah, yeah I was thinking about that too in terms of like once you broke up, how hard it was to like separate your own identity from what you had with Hazel. But I wonder if it was like harder for her. I think it was at first. Because I, I mean, like I said, she felt very sort of betrayed because I think, I mean, she was at the time, her boyfriend was Ken Irwin of Roundy Records. So he was very... Uh, encouraging to her and I think that that's what kind of helped her after we s split up was that he just sort of really helped her out and encouraged her and was super helpful to her and so and for me you know what I started doing was I started playing with other people um, you know I formed this band called the Harmony Sisters, and we toured a lot in the 80s. And um, so I was doing other things, but I was still, you know, I was still kind of finding my way. And, and, and at some point, you know, Mike and I split up, and then I moved to Nashville for a few months, but then I moved to Galax and started doing a lot of documentation. I was trying to learn, learn how to play old-time fiddle at that time. And... And that was the place to be. And mm. um, so there was a lot going on. I, and it was like, ooh, I want to take pictures. I want to write about this stuff. That's when I started the Old Time Herald magazine. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, God. Gosh. Yeah. You've done a lot of wonderful stuff, including Great Transition, the new album, Sun to Sun, which is out. If you're listening in real time, the album is out tomorrow. If you're listening after the release date of the podcast. The album's out now. Um, so the record features your young friends like Tatiana Hargraves and Reed Stutz. So all your musical life, you have sought out the older generation of players. And in your documentary, you say that in a way, we are the elders now. Um, and you have surrounded yourself with young players and have mentored countless people in your community how have you taken to like being an elder and taken to this role <laughs> in the folk community? Um, it took me a while to sort of accept that I was an elder. <laughs> I think, you know, it's like, oh my God. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, and I still, it's like, hmm, this is kind of weird, but I'm appreciative <laughs> of the fact that people might want to learn something from me. I mean, I, I do appreciate that. And and especially, they're such good musicians, some of these younger people. You know, they're really, God almighty, amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and yet they still feel like they have something to learn. And, and one of the things that I really appreciate is the fact that 
so many of the younger people that I hang out with, when I hang out with them, they're, they are really, it's really important to them to go to the wellspring, you know, to go to the source. And so it's not just me, but they really appreciate, you know, where this music comes from and the people who made it and the sounds that were made back in the day. And that there's nothing really like that anymore. I mean, not coming from the ground up. The album came about during the pandemic. So you were working on a book. We'd love to hear an update on that. Um, and you were reviewing all your photographs, issues of your magazine, the Old Time Herald, talking to your friends about their stories, about what went down, musically speaking. So doing all of that work and remembering, how have you come to appreciate memory? Oh, good one. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> and um, I think, you know, as people age, memory becomes an issue for a lot of people. I, but but I don't have too much trouble. I forget people's names and stuff like that. But, oh. but I spent, I mean, there were people, the elders that I hung out with, some of them had great memories. And some of them were kind of beginning to have signs of dementia. And there was this one old guy who would he loved to play Pop Goes the Weasel. That was one of his favorite tunes. And so he would play it. And then two minutes later, he'd say, have I played Pop Goes the Weasel for you yet? And he'd just do this several times until we got him off track. And um, But then there were people, this man in his 90s, who had a mind like a steel trap, and he remembered everything. And he, would, he could just tell you about his life. And it was just so wonderful. And um, so... And I appreciate that. I mean, I think it's, I mean, I think if, you know, as I've said, I think somewhere, if there's any consolation in growing older, it's, it's being able to tell your story to somebody. And I think that like the people that I talked with and interviewed and talked to and lived among, they got a lot of reward out of that you were interested in them. You know, and they, this, um, this one old guy who was in his 90s, you know, he missed his friends who were, who had all died because he was so old. Most of his mm -hmm. contemporaries had died. And he, he really felt the loss of people around him who had knew the same things that he did, that had lived through the same things. And, and, um, and although he was totally ecstatic that there were these young people coming around who liked to hear him play and loved to hear him tell about his life and stuff like this, um, there is that issue, I think, for a lot of older people. And, and of course, we lived in a place where, you know, if somebody fell down and broke their hip or leg or something, they went to the nursing home and then a week later they were dead. There was a lot of that mm. stuff. And, um, so it was, I mean, I really appreciate when people can tell me about their, I mean, I like talking to them about their lives. And I'm, it makes me happy that people want to know about mine. Um, although I'm not, you know, I'm not one of these people who loves to talk about themselves that much. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, here we go again. <laughs> But yeah, but but I understand. And I mean, the reason Tatiana, Tatiana and I got together was when she first moved here. One of the reasons was that I was here, but also I she helped me digitize most of my black and white 35 millimeter photos. She just would come over and spend a day or half a day just doing that. And so we hung out a lot and it was really nice. She was on Basic Folk a while ago, mm -hmm. so we talked all about it. If listeners have not checked out the Tatiana Hargraves interview, we talk all about Alice. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that's really cool that she worked alongside you to help you do some archival work. Yeah. 
So how has all of this work going through your archives impacted the way that you're writing, playing, or even like approaching your music? And how does it show up on Sun to Sun? A lot of, I write a lot of songs about, that are impacted by my love of sort of old things, like old houses, you know, that are empty, sitting out in the middle of a field, old people that I was fond of and that were generous with their time and and their folkways and their music. And that's just a big thing for me. And I've written a lot of songs about that, but I've also written political songs. And I think that going on those Southern tours was what started Hazel off writing her more political songs too, because it just gave her permission to speak about a lot of the things that she had grown up with and, you know, poverty and coal mine disasters and things like this. And, and so she did start speaking her mind. And I think that I started writing songs too, that, reflected maybe other things, but they reflected what I was feeling. And, and uh, you know, like I was a parent and I had these four kids and life was, you know, I never had a moment to myself. And so I wrote, Mama's Gonna Stay. And, um, and I wrote Calling Me Home, which was about some of the old people that I had hung out with who had played music, taught mm-hmm. me things and, and stuff like that. So I think, you know, and I have a folder, probably like any musician who writes songs, I have a folder full of scraps of paper, you know, a sentence or a word or two that I think maybe I might use someday. (laughs) I throw them in this folder. And then, so one of the things that happened during the pandemic, aside from writing some brand new songs, I went through the folder and found some old stuff that I thought, oh, that's a pretty cool melody, or this is, this is, you know, I should take this and work with this thought, you know, stuff like that. So, um, I had a question that semi relates to the song Old C- Jim Crow. Uh, yeah. That song warns of the insidious way that oppressive laws reconstitute under new names. That's straight from the album bio, but maybe this is a 180. So going back to, to, you and Hazel back in the 1960s, the Southern Folk Cultural Revival Project. That's when you toured the South, black and white musicians performing traditional music, which had not been done very much before in the South. So fast forward to 2023, as someone who experienced segregation, uh, the Jim Crow South, and also integration, integration in folk music, how do you reflect on why it became white music and why the black kids didn't feel welcome? Um, I've thought about this a lot, but what do you think that that looks like today? I think it's beginning to change. I feel like one of the reasons, and it, it to some extent, within traditional culture, it was the same for kids who didn't want to play the old tunes that their parents played. They wanted to hear Bill Monroe and Arthur Smith and things that were more up-tempo and modern and zippy. And But I think for, for younger black kids, well, it's, you know, it, it might have just been too close to home, a lot of the, you know, the banjo. What was, you know, even though that was essentially an African instrument that, that came over with... Uh, slaves when they were taken to this country, it was thought of as a white instrument uh, because those are the people who, I don't know, it's hard to tell. I mean, there was a lot of mixing in the South of musicians in some ways. I mean, I know there are recordings of bands um, I'm trying to think of the names, but, you know, there'd be a black fiddler and a, the rest of the band was white or, a, you know, a ba- black banjo player or an entirely... Are you thinking of the Dave Matthews band? No. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is before Dave Matthews. But, but, but there were, you know, 
And it was mixed up and people were influenced. People like Bill Monroe were very influenced by black music. And, and you can just hear it when every time there's a blue note that a white person sings, you know, you know where that came from. And mm. wait, what's a blue in, note? It's a blue note. It's like a flatted note. Like you hit a note and then you flatten it slightly. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's a blue note. <laughs> I don't know. It's really, it's amazing how hard it is. I, I teach singing sometimes and, and at these camps and mostly it's white students. And when you try to get them to sing a blue note, they cannot do it. It's just the weirdest mm -hmm. thing. It's just like a flatted note, you know, I mean, if you mm -hmm. had to describe it, but it's in between, it's a note, it's in between a note, kind of. So, okay. but I mean, there were so many influence like syncopation and slurs and, you know, blue notes and everything. All that comes from African-American tradition and God knows how much might be Native American too. We don't know. Nobody's really done that explored that that much but but it because of segregation and because of racism you know it was not credited to to african american now i feel like there are a lot of young people who are trying to sort of take back their heritage in terms of banjos and fiddles and stuff like that but i think that for a lot of young people back in the, you know, 40s and 50s when, when bluegrass was happening and all this kind of stuff, they felt it was too close to to the old Jim Crow. It was too close to old segregation and racism. and Like um So they wanted to do something else. Music. Yeah. So Maybe. they want... The, and so, you know, there was this whole movement migration into the cities. And I think that, you know, a lot of rhythm and blues and stuff like that was much more appealing. Mm -hmm. And there was a whole scene where, which was all black music. And um, so that was a little easier to deal with, I think, for young people back then. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know, but it's a good wow. question. So, yeah, it's a difficult question. And, yeah. I, and I, I appreciate your answer. Something to think yeah. about. Yeah, but I think that young people now, it may be that it's far enough removed and and they're young people who understand that, you know, that to some extent this was appropriated from their tradition and they're, they're claiming, they're reclaiming that again. And that's mm -hmm. a really good thing, you know, and, they're, and they're, people are much more conscious about that. I think mm. now. Yeah. Not to um, do another 180 and go from a serious topic to a lighthearted one. Um, in your bio, one of the things that it says you enjoy is doing agility with your dog, Polly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I watched some videos of you and Polly, and I we have a 16-month-old English Mastiff puppy that oh. we were told is kind of insecure and oh. should do some agility training. So if you have any tips or tricks, well, let it roll. Um, yeah. I mean, I think with my dog, with Polly, she was a rescue and she was young. She had a lot of energy and she also was reactive to other dogs and was very, to some extent, reactive to people especially men who wore hats in particular, you know, she did not. And she's kind of Me gotten too. past. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. I just felt like I was going to have to do something. She needed a job. She's very smart and she just, you know, needed stuff to do. And I, I found, I mean, there's a whole dog world out there of people that I didn't know. And I started sort of researching it, finding people, and so I, you know, I joined an obedience class. I, there's something called nose work, which is like search and rescue type stuff. You know, the dogs who sniff at the airport and, you know, they, they, you train them on a particular odor and they alert you when they find that odor. That's, that's a fun game. I love to do that too. And she, Polly loves it. 
And then I discovered agility, <laughs> which I love, and which we still do. I mean, she's getting, she's like probably close to 13 now, but she still loves doing wow. it. She's in, she's in good shape. And, you know, she's slowing down like me. But um, so we do that. And I think, you know, it, it's just, I love the, I love being a team with my dog. That idea of the two of you working together is very appealing to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, you know, I got started on, I wish I'd discovered all this sooner, but I've always had dogs all my life. And mm -hmm. so Polly was another dog and it just turned out that it was my time to find all this other stuff. I never, you know, <laughs> these other dog sports that, you know, there are a lot of dog sports out there. And, and you know, there's dock diving, there's, you know, fetch, throw, fetch and go or something where you toss discs and they bring them back and stuff like this. All these different games that you can play, but you just have to find you know, dogs, look under dog sports. And if you go and just, dog you can sports. look at, just look under agility too. They have all kinds of classes. I mean, yeah, generally, you had a very impressive course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's another thing that's, it's kind of neat because I have to remember the course and that's a trial. Sometimes you, it, you have to remember the course and it's like, it can consist of 20, 22 obstacles sometimes. And, wow. And you have to really appreciating memory. Yeah. And so it's, it's not easy, <laughs> but yeah, you, you should do that. And, you know, most agility people mostly use border collies because they're very uh, intent on the handler. They always have their, it's like watching sheep. If you've ever watched, you know, mm. they just are very mm -hmm. intense and they watch the handler and they, so their eyes are on the handler all the time. Polly's like looking around and sniffing the ground for crumbs. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes it more difficult, but I see all kinds of dogs doing agility. Mm. But you, I mean, and if you're just doing it for fun, it doesn't matter, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. And I think she likes it. I've been trying to get her to jump on some park benches and then jump over oh, the park yeah. benches. Oh, yeah. That's a, I do that with Polly, too. We'll go for walks and, you know, these cistern things that they have sometimes, you know, she'll go up over those. And we just it's like park her city park, doggy parkour. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, um, Alice, uh, I've kept you for a little bit long, um, but I'm wondering if you have time to do the lightning round. <gasps> that well, sounds like a it. yes <laughs> <laughs> go ahead hit me okay here we go breakfast lunch or dinner uh dinner so where is the weirdest place you have ever played music it doesn't have to be a gig like practice or jamming or a gig i guess the weirdest place in my memory <laughs> is when hazel and i played this gig it, we were just sort of, it was the beginning of sort of women's, women's liberation. I had to ask somebody back then what that meant. And we played this place where they did not allow men to come in. It was just all, all women. And we were like, what? <laughs> but, you know, the, so that was kind of weird at the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can relate to that. Yeah. Um, all right. Next question. What is the best comfort food? Oh, ice cream. Mm, good one. Chocolate with Asa almonds. Ooh, with the crunch. Yeah. Okay. Aside from all the people that you perform with, not to cause a rift within your own band, who is the most exciting up-and-coming musician? Um, well, who is the most? There are so many. <laughs> who I came to your head first? Tatiana came into my head first. Ah. Uh. But then I think, oh, no, but there's blah, blah, and there's blah, blah. You know, there's... All right, we'll go with Tatiana Hargraves. Okay. That is a decent <laughs> answer. Okay, a couple more. What is your favorite instrument to play? I'm going to say fiddle. It's not my main instrument, but it's. I have a very soft... I mean, I love playing the fiddle, and I'm, you mm -hmm. know, I play strictly old-time music with it, but... Okay, here's the last question. Mm -hmm. Where is the most beautiful place in the world that you have been to? 
in the mountains near Denver, Colorado, where you could sit out on the porch at night and watch shooting stars go over the sky. That was, oh. I was only there one, tw- twice, but it was just amazing. That sounds good. Yeah. Alice Gerard, thank you so much for being on Basic Folk and congratulations on being awesome. And <laughs> thank you record. so much. I really, I enjoyed this conversation a lot and you asked some great questions, so. Thanks. This episode of Basic Folk was produced by John Nungesser. Alex Stanton composes our music. Basic Folk is on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network. You can find all of our episodes there, wherever you get podcasts. You can also search for Basic Folk on the SiriusXM app, or you can check out our website, basicfolk.com. If you like this episode, you can share it with a friend. Maybe that person that you met on the train who also knew all of the funniest lines to curb your enthusiasm and you exchanged numbers because you thought you were going to be best friends forever, but you haven't reached out quite yet. You also maybe were talking about how awesome bluegrass is and old time and we're kind of like debating on which one was better, but you really haven't had an opportunity to continue that conversation as well as all those great curb your enthusiasm quotes. Well, listen, you could send that person this episode and get that friendship going. All right. Thanks for listening all the way to the end. We'll talk to you next time. Bye. Bye.